Hi, Ellen. Welcome to the webinar. It looks like we have a good crowd of people and there's still some people joining the room. I know everyone has a lot on their minds and on their plates right now, and I want to thank you all for taking the time to join us today. Our team has prepared a presentation that we think you'll find very useful as you look to work with your cybersecurity teams on addressing risk. We'll be getting started here shortly, but I want to call your attention to a few things. First, you should all have a GoToWebinar dashboard on the side of your screen. You can use that to ask questions throughout the webinar. Just drop them in the questions section of the dashboard. You also have a glossary available in the handouts tab of the dashboard. Our presentation today should run roughly 45 to 50 minutes, and we'll follow that with a 15 minute Q&A. If you have any specific questions about cybersecurity and internal audit at your organization, we're happy to take those conversations offline as well. Second, CPEs will be issued to attendees within 48 hours of the end of the first webinar. In order to qualify for your CPE, you do need to attend for the duration of today's session, and you need to complete at least three of the poll questions that will be asked during the presentation. Third, I know we have some folks on their first Focal Point webinar today, so I'd like very briefly to introduce who we are. Focal Point is a leading cybersecurity services provider working with the Fortune 500 and government agencies. We integrate market-leading consulting, technology integration, and cyber workforce development services to provide end-to-end -end solutions for security leaders looking to future-proof their companies against threats, changing data protection laws, and growing workforce shortages. You can learn more about our services, solutions, and team at focal-point.com. All right, now before we get started, let me introduce our panel for this afternoon. I'm your host, Ariana Flores, and I'm a senior consultant in Focal Point's Risk Advisory Team. Our primary cybersecurity subject matter expert today is Brett Phillips. He's a director of cyber strategy at Focal Point. Thank you for joining us, Brett. Thanks, Ariana, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm I've been with Focal Point for a little over 12 years now. I started out in internal audit and in our co-sourcing practice, and then about 10 years into my career, transitioned to the cybersecurity practice, and have been focused on PCI, and, and now I lead our, our PCI and QSA, or payment card security services here at Focal Point. So I look forward to the conversation, and, and, and uh, hope, hope we have some, uh, some good questions come in. <laughs> Thank you. Now, we also have Donnell Martinez. He's a director of risk advisory, and he'll be bringing his internal audit expertise to us from sunny Miami, Florida. Thank you for joining, Donnell. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. And I, I've been at Focal Point for roughly seven years, and I've been in different functions around the, the audit group, and, and we've been moving. So we've seen how internal audit is getting deeper into, into different and so many different areas of organizations. and. Uh, I look forward to our conversation today and Brad that it's going to give us a lot of new information. Thank you. Now, this panel has a range of expertise in, this, in different aspects of internal audit and cybersecurity, and I'm very excited to hear their thoughts in today's discussion. We hope we feel very privileged to have the opportunity to speak with you today and hope that you get some insights here that will help you as you work to integrate cybersecurity and internal audit efforts. Now, for the late joiners, just a quick reminder to drop your questions in the questions section of your GoToWebinar dashboard, and our panelists will answer them during the Q&A portion of the webinar. And with that, let's get started. Now, the idea of this webinar began when our team was researching recent data breaches and how the internal audit team can help identify potential weaknesses from a cybersecurity perspective. Our team came upon a very interesting case that seems like the perfect storm of vulnerabilities and it turned into a universal story that even those with no IT experience could follow. Without further ado, I'll read this story and there should be a poll question after for those of you to answer what the company you think is. Now, a neighborhood association in a wealthy area of Atlanta, Georgia, issued a warning that there were potential burglaries to be expected in the area as a resident recently experienced a robbery. This warning was sent to all residents via email. However, the association mailing list was not up to date with the newest residents from the past year. The perpetrator was going around the neighborhood surveilling for access points and zoned in on a large mansion toward the end of the neighborhood. This was the home of a prominent private investigator who performed some of his screenings and consultations at home for the sake of privacy, as he had multiple high profile clients. There was a back door in the mansion with a broken lock one that was alarmed by a major security company which performed scans on any potential weak entry points. The credit card used to pay the company's subscription services was expired, and as such, the company discontinued scanning services. 
At first, the perp just entered the house and looked around to see what kind of access they had to the mansion. Once comfortable with the entry point, the perp entered and accessed the kitchen, where the alarm system's password was written on a post-it note in the refrigerator. Once a perpetrator had the password from the post-it note, he could access any room in the house, as it was a code for all secured rooms, even the private investigator's office and library, which were alarmed at the time. The perpetrator came back 76 times to the house before the private investigator noticed that there was even a break-in. The private investigator had an application that would show him historical data of all secured areas accessed within the house. The app was still available, but the PI did not notice that the historical records had not been updated since he was still able to access his account through the application. Once the private investigator updated his credit card information, he began seeing unusual activity in his office and library at odd hours of the night. He also received the notification of the vulnerable back door. This door lock was immediately fixed and the private investigator updated the password for the secure doors, but not before thousands of files for high profile clients in compromising situations were scanned and uploaded to the dark web, leaving them exposed to the highest bidder. Now, for those of you on the call that know the company that the story is addressing, a poll question should show up on your screen, so please respond with your best guess. We're just waiting on a few of the attendees to respond to the poll question. Okay. Now, for those of you that answered Equifax, you are correct. Equifax is a case that has been widely studied, and our team was taking a look at the case as we developed a series of white papers and noticed that this case was a perfect storm of vulnerabilities that were exploded for a breach. As such, we wanted to address a number of key cybersecurity concepts and how internal audit can help strengthen these areas. Here we see a couple of items that stood out in the story that represent very real vulnerabilities in the Equifax case. For example, the broken backdoor lock, it signifies an unpatched server that allowed hackers to get in. The security code accesses that were easily accessible on a post-it note, that highlights unencrypted passwords that gave the hackers additional access to the databases. Now all rooms accessible with the same code signify unsegmented networks that were exploited to access sensitive information and the sensitive files that were stored in the home office and library, those represent the, cus the consumer information that was exposed. That being said, we will get started with our first topic and I will hand it over to Brett to walk us through network segmentation, what it is and why it's important as it relates to cybersecurity. Yeah, so you know, network segmentation, you can think of it like uh, the, the, the diagram we just saw of a house. It, it's very much in the same way that you would design a building or a home with rooms and doors and locks and windows. Network is no different. You're going to divide up your network into smaller compartments and then apply security controls and network policies that are going to limit traffic to and from those, those different departments or, 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 or network zones. So. In, in that respect, it, there are some some, some uh, similarities there to the story we just heard. And the more uh, complex or the more um, detailed that segmentation is uh, is implemented within your organization, the harder it is for an attacker to navigate your network and ultimately get to the data that they're they're after your your most sensitive and critical data. Right, and not not all companies are the same. Uh, in terms of maturity level of a company, when would you expect to see a company implement this? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, every company is different, shape, size, complexity. Um, so, you know, not not one answer is going to fit every company. But, you know, it is very rare for us to see uh, organizations that don't implement some type of te- uh, segmentation internally uh, at their network. And, you know, usually there always is a, a, a firewall barrier between the Internet and, and your internal network. And then usually a DMZ that handles a lot of your inbound uh, traffic from the internet and evaluates it. And then another uh, segmentation barrier between that DMZ and your internal network um, to evaluate those connections inbound to, to make sure that they're appropriate. And then you might see in your internal network, your users and some of your workstations that may be more, um, may be more uh, a higher risk, if you will, um, a higher likelihood that they may be compromised via malware or other vulnerabilities, those might be segmented off away from your applications so that, once again, if, if the system was compromised in your user network, it would be, uh, you want to make it as challenging as possible for that attacker to then pivot to, uh, to your applications and therefore, and then you know, further down the stream would be databases where your data is actually residing and keeping those even more locked down and in a zone that uh, has even tighter locks and controls is really what uh, organizations should be striving to. Great. Now, in terms of internal audit, what are some key topics that would be important for auditors to understand as it relates to network segmentation? Yeah. So, you know, with when we talk about audit, um, it there there could be a hesitation to dive into the cybersecurity side of things because it may get too technical too fast. But there are some pretty um, pretty pretty key concepts that relate that I think any internal auditor should you know have a handle on or be able to at least approach. And the first one um, that I want to bring up is just asset management and 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 along with that data classification. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know knowing where your sensitive data is. It's really the first step in designing your network appropriately and then applying those network segmentation controls. And, and, and that, if you're not, if the organization isn't aware of where their data is or in what systems are processing the sensitive data, then it makes it very challenging for the networking team or the security team to apply the proper policies because, um, you know, a, a common example is a, a change gets implemented and, uh, you know, a firewall rule is uh, traffic is permitted to a system that they don't think is sensitive or doesn't have sensitive data, but in fact, it is storing social security numbers or PII information. And then it, uh, you know, potentially compromised with this very permissive rule. And it was only implemented, the rule that was implemented uh, was done so under false pretense, uh, you know, without knowing that that data was actually there. So. Um, you know, asset, having a strong asset management program is really key uh, because it, it piggybacks on this network segmentation discussion. Great, thank you. And now, luckily, we do have some evidence that us as auditors we typically receive when we're going through um, firewalls during our audit. When you look at this dashboard, what stands out to you and what do you think it's important to zone in on? Sure. So, you know, this is uh, every firewall technology has its own uh, unique characteristics. We're looking at a checkpoint firewall, but, um, you know, they're all from a rule based perspective and the network policies applied. They're all going to have the same concepts. And traditionally, you're going to see a source and that's going to be the uh, origination of the traffic defining that. It may be the Internet. It may be the DMZ. It may be some internal network. Uh, the destination of the rule is going to obviously tell where the traffic is allowed to go. And then the um, ports, protocols, sometimes it's labeled applications or services, um, but that is essentially going to uh, dictate what type of traffic. So, you know, defining which port or which service is allowed with this rule kind of is the three components that make up the network policy. And then obviously there is a and accept or deny, so you can set the the traffic up to permit permit the traffic, or you can set the rule up to deny the traffic. So, it's really you know those four attributes are what make up the rule, and that's what we have to evaluate to see if there are any concerns in those four elements. 
Got it. Now, when your team receives that, could you walk us through the process of how you would go about assessing or evaluating those rules? Yeah, so the the rules themselves can be, you know, it, they can be tough to analyze in the, da- the firewall dashboard itself. Usually what we'll do is we'll ask for an export based on the technology. We'll give them the commands that, that would get us the data back. Uh, and then we have written custom programs here at Focal Point that parse that data into Excel. So it's a very readable format and translates a lot of the network object names and the actual IP addresses so that we can analyze what is really happening here. Um, and then, you know, once we have it in that readable format, we can start to very clearly pick out some, some concerns, if you will, um, that, that may be a part of the, the rule set. So you can see in the, third row on the screen here, we've got a rule that has an any for destination and an any for service. And any anytime you see the word any, that means that that is almost uh, infinite <laughs> in the definition, if you will. So the, um, the particular rule allows any type of traffic to any destination. That could be internal, that could be external. And, you know, it any anytime you see the word any as an auditor, you should probably call that rule out and at least ask the owner of that rule or whoever um, uh, required that rule to go in that way to justify why it is that way. So any is definitely a, a key word to look for in a file rule set. Other things we look for are like uh, large ranges of ports or large ranges of, of network objects or IP addresses. So the first row is, is one of those examples. That destination destination object is, is actually allowing all uh, traf- uh, the traffic from the source to every 10.000 slash 8 address, which is essentially every internal network room, zone. So while it can't hit the internet per se, it can hit every single internal network with this, um, with this rule. And then obviously there are three defined ports there. So it is limited a little bit in the, in the amount of traffic, but the uh, expansive nature of that destination object wouldn't make me question that. And, and once again, you know, call that out as a potential finding for either remediation or further information. So, and then finally, I just want to point out another, another thing that we can look at even from a non-technical standard is, you know, the second row, while it may not look like a, a major concern on, on the surface, we knew that the source that we have highlighted there was uh, related to an, a legacy SIM or event management tool. And it, we knew that that system had been um, sunset probably a year and a half to two years ago. And so we flagged it and then it, uh, sure enough, it came to find out that that rule was no longer needed because those systems were uh, no longer online. So while maybe the risk was a little bit lower than some of these other examples I gave, it does indicate a cleanup effort that needed to occur because anytime you're permitting traffic inside your your environment, there's really no reason to permit it unless it's required. Got it. And that's where a mature asset management process would, would come into play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a good point. Yeah. So Obviously, there was a, a, a uh, that cleanup ever I mentioned should have happened when that asset was retired. So someone forgot to let the firewall or the security team know that that system had been uh, retired, and there's a firewall effort or cleanup effort that needed to occur. So um, that kind of does go back to what I was mentioning there on that asset management side. Got it. Now, in terms of um the, the next step or the changes to, to these rules, uh, we do have some evidence of how a business would essentially justify the, the, the rules that we've just seen. Um, and this is highlighted as a good business justification example. Now, from what you've seen, why does this look like a good business justification for the rules? Right, so the, what we just talked about is more of our test of excessive traffic and looking for rules that are overly permissive and, and could allow an attacker to navigate your network and, 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 and breach uh, certain data, right? 
Now, this is the, the other key topic that I think from an auditing standpoint could really be emphasized moving forward because traditionally what I see is while organizations are very adept at uh, requesting the change and uh, maybe explaining at a high level why the change is needed and then it is approved um, through the cab or you know change uh, approval process there a lot of organizations struggle with the kind of the checkpoint in the change control process it's almost like that risk analysis where someone comes in and says okay i see you've requested this and you tell me it's for the new video projection system but you don't really provide any reason why you need any port uh requested it just is kind of a a we need this and please implement it kind of approach. So usually once we get done with maybe the excessive uh, rules and ana analysis in that respect, we do sample more rules that maybe aren't excessive. Maybe they're just implemented as, um, you know, uh, kind of a normal rule would be, but then we go back and look for what's called a business justification. And that's where we're, we're asking them to go to that next level in the change control process to really um, give us evidence that there was a risk analysis done to make sure that the traffic that was asked was appropriate and the least amount of traffic that's really required. Um, so the example we have on the screen here is you can kind of see it's a little bit small writing, but at the bottom there in the, um, the service now ticket for the change, it does have a business justification and it says uh, for network management to SSH to manage the DMZ devices. And then we have the rule, which is up top, that's the actual firewall rule, and we essentially do a delta on that, and we say, all right, does that business justification match what this rule is ultimately doing? And for this case, it is, you can see the source is the network engineering VLAN, the destination is the DMZ devices, which are usually those uh, maybe those Cisco Edge devices or, you know, some of those uh, devices in the DMZ I was mentioning earlier. And then obviously at the very end there, you've got the SSH port is the only service or port allowed with this rule. So while it's it's kind of a very in-your-face good example, it does just emphasize why you don't need to necessarily make these business justifications super complex or um, verbose. You just need to explain why I need this and only implement what you need. And that's really the core concepts of what we're trying to drive home with, with this kind of business sampling of rules and business justification test. Got it. And in terms of implementing any required change, uh, who would we typically see that is the person to implement this, this change if it's required? Yeah, so it, this, this is another uh, answer that kind of depends. It, in larger organizations, we have seen that shift to uh, maybe pull back the ownership of the actual rules and security the rules provide, have moved that into that information security or uh, cybersecurity team. So there is a little bit of independence between them and the actual firewall administration or network engineering team. If the organization is smaller, we do see that blended firewall administration team and also in charge of the rule sets. And I would just caution everyone that if your organization is set up in that manner, what we've typically seen is the firewall administration team is more concerned with the availability of the network and making sure applications work and systems can connect. And um, they are maybe less uh, inclined to push back on the security topics that we're talking about. So that's when the, you know, the internal audit function even is more important to, to maybe question, like I was mentioning, just question these rules and, and push back on some of the you know, justifications that maybe aren't uh, as clear as, as the one we were, were presenting here today. Gotcha. Now, speaking of unclear justifications, we have what would we would deem a bad or negative business justification example for our firewall rules. Could you walk us through what we're seeing here and why it's considered a bad example? Yeah, and, and I should note, you know, we're going to see probably um, one or, or two or three good examples to every 10 or so bad examples. So <laughs> we wanted to give a bad example just to be fair. 
And, you know, one of the things for this test is, you know, we would pick out this particular rule and they would give back the business justification that came from the client. They said this ticket number, it relates to X window system access. And some of the traffic did relate to uh, the X window pro protocol, but we wanted, we, this is what you'll typically see in this kind of initial iteration is when you ask for a business justification, they'll just explain the rule. They won't actually, they'll explain what the rule does, but they won't actually tell you the why. And that's what we're after. We're after the why. Why did you permit this traffic? So then we said, okay, we need more of a, of a justification or a why does this traffic exist? Uh, and then they came back and said, well, it, it's for the phone system. And we kind of, you know, we were like, okay, so I did a little independent research and the the porter, the protocols that were uh, allowed didn't really match up with any of the phone systems that I typically uh, saw. And, you know, it, they're just clearly something wasn't still making sense. So I just said, would you please provide the vendor documentation from your 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 phone system vendor that would support that conclusion? A little bit of time went by. And they came back and said, oh, I, I, actually, we did some more research, and this was for a legacy phone system that we no longer use at this site, and we're um, actually going to disable the rule. So, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of a um, don't be discouraged if the first time through you get a lot of um, kind of very short, small business justifications. It's just important to really um, hold them to a standard where, you know, it's it's almost silly to say out loud, but they should, I say they, the organization should know the traffic that is permitted throughout their environment. If there's a lot of unknowns with the rules that you do sample, that's just, that's a cause for concern right there, right? So make them go to that next level of really researching it. And it does take time and you can't do it all in one day or one iteration, but we're just trying to improve things incrementally over time. And Brett, um, from a, so when when they say from an audit perspective, we identify some rules that are going to get fixed. And you know, from audit, we always think, okay, what will have happened, and and you know, the whole risk assessment. What what expectation will we have from the teams to go back in time and see if something needed to be uh, looking into based on these rules? Yeah, I mean, there are there are definitely things that you can do within the firewall platform to help identify how much traffic this rule is really allowing. It's a thing called hit count, and that will tell you basically how many times this rule has been applied. And if you um, ask for that monitoring on that rule, you might see that the hit count is very low, and therefore you can probably reasonably assume that this has not been a major concern historically. But if you see the opposite, and this tr this rule has been used a lot, and there is really no reason or no one knows why it exists, then yeah, you, you probably do need to do some, some analysis internally there with your, you know, uh, looking back at system logs and things like that, to just uh, do some due diligence um, on what potential traffic or what potential exposure to a breach had occurred, but I will say that it is very difficult to, uh, you know, kind of piece that together historically, unless there's a known event that you can start, okay, here's the time when the breach occurred, and then you can go back and trace, and maybe you will see this rule was the, the, the rule that ultimately ended, in, ended up in a breach, but, you know, my stance is always, let's, let's move, let's try to improve moving forward. So any new rules implemented, we're going to do it the right way. We're going to have a good business justification. All that will be documented change ticket. And then over time, we're going to clean up these legacy rules and start to really close the, the back doors and the loopholes in your network segmentation. Perfect. Now, for those of you on the call, our second poll question should be showing up on your screen. Please take a second to read and respond.
we'll just give it a few more seconds for attendees to finish responding. Now our next topic is minimum security baselines. Brad, in terms of um, cybersecurity, could you please walk us through what is a minimum security baseline and why it's important for, for cybersecurity? Sure, so you know, MSBs uh, kind of have a lot of different names, hardening standards, configuration standards, build guides. There's, there's kind of um, you know, a few different names that you might hear based on the organization and what they choose. But essentially, they're all, uh, they're all trying to um, init take a system from initiation or purchase and, and, and raise its minimum security level uh, to an appropriate, uh, uh, appropriate uh, baseline <laughs> and, and, and get the system ready for production so that it's not vulnerable um, before it goes into production. So I think that's probably the easiest way to describe it. You're just raising that minimum security level uh, to an appropriate place uh, for, uh, for production. Thank you, now, Donnell. I know we've worked a lot closely with MSBs this year. Now, why would an internal auditor use MSBs or how could they leverage it um, to improve cybersecurity in the company? So from an audit perspective, obviously an MSV is, is fairly technical in nature, right? Because it's focused on the on the technology that is making sure that it aligns with. Uh, but from, from an audit perspective, the focus should be in the process, right? So how does how how do organizations make sure that when they implement new technologies in the environment, do they have at least a checklist where they can go one by one to make sure that everything is ready to go by the time they move in production. And then at the same time, as they have it already in there, do they, do they have the ability to keep up with these MSBs in terms of when technologies change and, and all of that, they keep up with it and then adjust and, and create new hardening procedures to make sure the technologies keep up with all of these standards. Sure, and, and then in terms of scalability, what would you say is the next level? once a company has the proper MSBs, what would be the next step? Yeah, so, and I believe an MSB control can be very, very powerful because it can cover so many areas of your different, if you look at, at your different frameworks, it covers, you know, from logical access all the way to your encryption or cryptography requirements. And the, the next level of maturity will be, that there are tools out there, so a lot of the organizations that, that all of us work for and the, and the, and the team that, join today, they do have tools that can go and check periodically that they, they are meeting the requirements of the MSB. And, and maybe maybe some companies don't have that, but I, we all know what a screenshot is, right? And a screenshot is good enough. And at the end of the day, the, the next level of maturity is, is there a periodic process to make sure this MSB is met? Because maybe at some point, the technology somehow just flip a switch and now it's not meeting the MSB. So is there somebody periodically going back there and making sure that the flip is switched back on when it happens. Great, thank you. Now here we have a sample of a table of contents of an MSB. Uh, Brett, what sticks out to you in terms of how an MSB should be um, essentially created from the sample? Yeah, you know, I think this is, we want to choose this sample because it's, it's very extensive in nature, right? It obviously it's touching a lot of different configurations. This one is is tailored toward the Windows operating system, and and so just by the very nature, um, you'll see similar MSBs, uh, or you should on maybe the Linux side as well. Uh, just because operating systems, you tend to have more uh, to to configure and 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 disable or enable or customize uh, versus maybe a uh, a Cisco router or, or a switch of some kind that, that is maybe a little bit more basic. Um, still needs an MSB for those technologies, but you know this is definitely one that was was well thought out and uh, and they put the proper uh, steps in place to get that base installer or you know image if you will from Microsoft 
to a level that, that uh, is customized for their organization. So this is typically what we see. And then going back to the comparison of examples here, we see a good MSB example and a bad MSB example. What's the difference between the two and how could we get it from a bad to a good example? <laughs> yeah, so I think the, the, the main thing that jumps out when I look at an at MSB at a new organization um, that we might be assessing is, is the MSB actionable? You know, can I take it and actually use it um, the, the the actual document and then use it step by step to configure the system. So, you know, typically what we'll see is uh, customized. Maybe the uh, you know, syslog or, or or audit log settings are set up to go to the sim collector. The NTP source is customized. Here you have password uh, parameters that have been customized to meet the organization's password policy. So these are all steps and settings and things that can actually be configured and followed. The one on the right is a little bit more high level. It's, it's tailored toward frameworks and compliance objectives and, and it meets, uh, I guess, the uh, definition of it will do these things or it should do these things. But in our eyes, an MSB needs to be, like I said, actionable and there are no steps there are no actual instructions what settings need to be changed to actually meet the control objectives that we have listed out here. So if we get something like this back, we're probably going to push back and have them, uh, like I said, customize it in a way that it, it would allow someone with you know, basic IT skills to get that system in line from a security perspective. Great, thank you. Now, moving into our final topic, I know sometimes this topic can get a little daunting for people that are not, that don't have too much of a technical background, uh, but in terms of encryption, now what is it and why is it important in terms of cybersecurity? Yeah, I mean, encryption is is super important from a data protection standpoint. Um, you know, it's the, it's, it's the last line of defense, if you will. So if the system is compromised, Logically, if the network is compromised, you would hope that the data itself is encrypted so that if someone were to extract it, it would be very, very, very hard for them re to reconstruct that data. Um, so that's, that's why, you know, encryption is, uh, you know, it's still very important that, uh, that organizations are using encryption properly and using the right encryption techniques. But um, yeah, it's uh, still very critical. <laughs> And in terms of the types of encryption, could you walk us through the some of the types of encryptions that we see? Right. So, you know, there there's usually kind of two two different avenues for encryption. One, the data in transit from point A to point B. We want to encrypt that traffic, especially if it's over the internet, especially if it's sensitive in nature, even if it's internal. Um, things like passwords, if you're authenticating authenticating to a, a web based portal. It could be an internal web-based portal um, through your browser. If that uh, authentication page is using uh, using weak uh, encryption ciphers on that on that transmission, then someone inside your network could potentially intercept that uh, traffic, grab your password, and then use it to log into other systems. So, uh, data in data in transit is very important and. You know, I think one of the tools out there, free to use, is uh, Qualys SSL, SSL Labs uh, test site, and um, you know, it it allows you to put in any URL, an internet-facing URL, and it will run its test to see what kind of ciphers are allowed and if there are any concerns. So, you know, it's just something I do even in personal life. If you know, I'm logging into a new site to enroll in something. Um, I like to know that that site is using the proper uh, protections on, on that web traffic. And then, and obviously the other side that I think most people are, are, are familiar with as well is the at rest or, you know, actually store storage of data encryption on data at rest. So, you know, those, those are typically your databases, your file systems, uh, you know, those classic uh, file storage mechanisms implying some level of encryption either at um, all the way down to the column inside the database, the table, the database itself. If it's a file, 
encrypting the files. Um, so, you know, there's, there's always, usually there's always a, a, um, uh, there's always a way or there's always a way to better protect the data. It just may, you know, incur some additional research and, and, and time. Yeah. And then, so this table is just a very clear, uh, clear cut example of, um, you know, different encryption, uh, data at rest, uh, encryption mechanisms and, and, you know, from an auditing perspective, it's important for us to make sure that we're up to date on these because over time, these do become in and out of, of, of uh, acceptance, if you will. So like, you know, DES has been, uh, uh, been bad for, for decades. And then, you know, one of the, uh, the key points that we always need to focus in on is key size. The larger the key size, obviously the stronger the encryption. So, um, you know, AES-128 is, 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 is probably okay, but AES-256 is kind of industry best standard. So knowing uh, the differences and making sure you're staying up on these concepts is, is how you're going to essentially spot a problem, <laughs> if you will, when it comes to encryption. And ultimately, we want to protect our data. Now, how would the type of data affect how it's encrypted? Uh, yeah, I mean, it just uh, once again kind of goes back to that that data data classification discussion. Um, you know, knowing what data is important to your organization, and and then there are obviously key data types like payment cards and social security numbers and and other um, you know medical health record information. Those elements across the board are the ones that everyone knows about and should be encrypted. Now, there may be other uh, information that are, are super important to your organization. Maybe it's some type of intellectual property and that some type of design document. You know, um, I, I would guess the Coke formula, if it's stored online, I don't think it's stored online, but I would hope that that is encrypted and locked away very <laughs> tightly, right? So these things that even if they're not some of the industry specific data types, like I was mentioning, you really have to evaluate your, with your organization. Do we have some some files out there that are super important um, and need uh, need that extra level of protection? Like I was mentioning, just in case uh, the bad guys get in. Gotcha. Now, for those of you on the call, this will be our final poll question. Uh, it should show up on your screen, so please take a moment to read and respond. Now we'll just give it a few more seconds as our attendees finish responding to the poll. Okay, thank you. Now, Donnell, could you walk us through at-rest encryption and the types and how um, a business could leverage each of these types or why they're important? Yeah, and from an audit perspective, an important piece to say is you, there, there are so many different techniques and, and so many different technologies. So what, what I need to understand is when I'm assessing the, the encryption strategy of my organization is understanding where am I coming from, right? Is there protected health information? Uh, is, there, is, is there GDPR requirements? And from there, I can have 
better ways to ask questions. Now, from, from address, a good example is we talk about this level encryption and transparent data encryption, and, and we're focusing specifically on the central databases where all this information is hosted. And uh, sometimes we believe that this level encryption might be sufficient to protect the data. However, when we're talking about all these servers with data, first of all, with all of the virtualization happening, right, it's, it's, it's more likely that these servers don't even exist physically. And, and second of all, by the time that the, this level of encryption has been bypassed, it's because your, your potential breach or your potential attacker already has direct access, they, the, the, the hard drive has been decrypted. So transparent data encryption is a way to make sure that your databases it, as in a thread I was saying, you can even do it at the field level or at the column level to make sure that your, your key information is protected. And ultimately, it would only protect against physical theft. Yeah, and, and it's fair to say, obviously, if you have a laptop, you, you definitely want to make sure it's encrypted. <laughs> so uh, look at your own laptops to make sure they, they are all uh, are like that. But going back to the servers, there are other technologies that um, might be needed depending on the type of data that your organization holds. Got it. Now, in terms of key management, encryption key management, Brett, who typically has ownership of this process? Yeah, so key management is usually, uh, well, I guess maybe traditionally it was still owned by the database administrators, um, and they obviously Either way, you're going to have a hand in it um, because most of the the uh, encryption mechanisms are integrated with the database itself. Um, but you know, we have seen where uh, application owners and kind of the the more on the business side, even like the business owners that are ultimately the, owning the teams that are putting this data in the applications in the databases, um, they're becoming more involved just to create some independence. And, and also just some, some additional oversight so that, you know, they're more, um, you know, they're just more ingrained with the, with the, the whole encryption process. So if there needs to be a key rotation or, uh, you know, maybe a, a special stored procedure that's going to decrypt a lot of data for a specific purpose or, or, or a regulatory audit, those kind of things, um, then you're going, you're, you might want someone on the business side to kind of approve that or at least be aware of that. So we are seeing um, more and more that there's a, a shift more on the application side to uh, to own some of that key management um, responsibilities for sure. And Brett, as we see more of the system administrators every day using SSH keys to directly connect to the servers, uh, I want to get a little bit of your thoughts of what you've seen out there and, and what your thoughts are in terms of protecting those keys to make sure they're safe and secure. Yeah, it's a tough one for sure. The, you know, I, I see the benefits of it. And, you know, a lot of times they're, um, you know, in, I'll say one positive is with a traditional password, you could uh, dream up scenarios where you brute force that password um, and then get into that system where an SSH key, you're not going to be uh, able to do that. So, so from that respect, there, there are better than passwords. But I will say, if the workstation of the administrator is compromised and uh, the attacker gets access to their private key file, then they're able to log into any system in the organization without any other stop, uh, you know, any other checkpoint along the way. So it does create a kind of an additional risk or a different risk uh, that passwords would, in that scenario, um, protect against. Uh, so, so. You know that that that's uh, a little bit of of the other side of the coin, and just you know from a um, you know the the SSH key. Usually, what we will push back on is there is the ability to uh, add a password to protect the SSH key, <laughs> which kind of defeats the purpose of what the administrator is hoping to gain to get away from passwords. But it, it's just one of those scenarios where you know there is that level of risk there if your local workstation laptop is compromised then it's like having your password in a clear text text file so um there there needs to be probably some mitigating controls uh to to help prevent that got it thanks thank you and well with that 
Um, I think we can begin our Q&A portion. Thank you both Brett and Donnell for chatting with us today and giving us some of your expertise. Um, we will now read some of the questions for our experts to answer. So if you haven't, please submit your questions to the questions tab in the GoToMeetings dashboard, and we will be reading out for, for Brett and Donnell to answer. Now I see here, the first question um, comes from Felicia, and it's what was the correct answer to the last poll question? Uh, now, I'm not sure if that's referring to the firewall or the encryption question, but the answer to the firewall changes was, um, I believe it's firewall administrator. And in terms of which encryption type uses a public, key, a public key to encrypt and a private key to decrypt, I believe we had that as in-transit encryption. Now we will wait here as some of the attendees write their questions for Brett and Donnell, and we encourage you um, to ask anything, whether it's related to internal audit or cybersecurity or any of the topics that we discussed today. Now we have a question coming in. Um, in your experience, how many organizations fail to secure their firewalls? Uh, so, uh, you know, I think uh, Danielle, you can you, you can probably chime in as well on the internal audit side. You know, we deal a lot, obviously, from a PCI assessment perspective uh, with the firewalls, and you know, I think logically, uh, you know, just the logical access to the firewalls themselves most of the time they're pretty locked down most of them are um, required or i'm sorry integrated with active directory uh, for authentication and then you know recently at least in the pci world there was the uh, requirement for multi-factor so those uh, themselves uh, the multi-factor helps obviously with with compromises um, from from exposed passwords you know i will say probably the one area that still is a struggle for all organizations and this is not just firewalls this is network devices across the board is the patch management side of it you know most organizations have a very good handle on the servers and the workstations and the typical operating system patching but these secondary systems that maybe weren't thought of very highly or weren't kind of at the forefront of the patch push um, in the last you know 10 years or so uh, have really kind of fallen behind in a lot of areas so you know we, we do typically see missing hot fixes or missing security patches on those network devices and firewalls that could lead to um, to compromise I and mean, we just saw in the last week the uh, the f5 vulnerability that came out and the palo alto the one the week before and these were pretty serious vulnerabilities and 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 if your organization uses those technologies um you know definitely need to if if it's not already been addressed needs to to be have a plan and a, and a remediation strategy pretty quickly for for those devices so and, and what i will say quickly is we see the, the tricky thing is um from a secure perspective you need to make compliance and you need to make security right and sometimes unfortunately they don't align so what I've seen is companies, obviously, you have to pick and choose. So companies will pick compliance and it's a little risky, right? Because it means, okay, where is my where is my credit card data? And then let me apply PCI requirements there, right? Where are my social security numbers and apply there instead of thinking security minded, but obviously you have to keep up with compliance before you can move to security. And that's what that's what we've seen. Perfect. Now we see another question coming in in respect to data classification. Uh, would you please explain best practices you're seeing regarding unstructured data? So I think from from our from our standpoint, um, the the data, if it becomes like you mentioned unstructured and it is is in a format that is less easy to um, 
to query, to read, to access, and this is more from a, the attacker standpoint, um, then you know we have maybe come to a a little bit of a, a middle ground, if you will, because I know a lot of those technologies are emerging and applying encryption to those may be, uh, you know, I guess <laughs> very complicated. So um, our standpoint is, you know, it always comes back to what are the what are the risks of compromise? You know, can you demonstrate even if the data is unstructured, un, uh, unstructured, can you demonstrate how you have limited logical access to it or what protections you have on if someone were to gain access and, and start querying that data set. So, um, you know, it, it's always kind of a, a balancing act where if maybe some of the traditional data protection uh, strategies aren't applicable anymore, you know, there usually is some other traditional uh, uh, mechanisms of control like logical access or, or firewall rule set that would um, help protect that data. Um, in that respect. So I hope I answered your question. And, and this goes a little bit into the data privacy field as well, right? Because the question is going back to, if I take a step back, when I have this unstructured data, what are my requirements, right? And, and how am I supposed to make sure that the data is encrypted to protect whatever is in those, uh, in all of those files and everywhere they are. So what we've seen too in the market is, there are a lot of technologies and tools that or, or solutions that their purpose is to specifically find where this data is or going back to the data classification data inventory that Brett mentioned. So that's that's where the focus is right now is identifying where all of this data is and trying to catch it and trying to put it into perspective and try to control it in terms of, of how access should be handled. So that's what we've seen. Great, and I think this will be our final question for today. Um, we see a lot of organizations have a ping command enabled within the firewall policy for troubleshooting purposes, but is it possible that attackers can use that as an advantage to initiate a DDoS attack? Um, <clears throat> so I think this is uh, this is nice to probably dovetail under our, our next uh, session with uh, Jeremy, who leads our cyber defense uh, team, but I, I will say with whenever we see ping or I, ICMP, it's you know it can be used for reconnaissance purposes. So uh, you can obviously sweep the organization, get back basic information that could allow you then to attack what seems like um, a system that that is worthy of attack, if you will. Um, I know there are scenarios where you could do a denial of service attack with that, but um, you know, from a, just from a, I guess this is more of a uh, operational answer. You know, there are some real cases where you do need ping to operate so that things, uh, so that, so that your networking team or your systems team can make sure that systems are up and available. And, and so, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those uh, protocols that I think you know, it, it probably needs to occur, um, and the the challenge is, like you mentioned, how do we mitigate the risk that that is naturally there, um, but still allow the organization to function and and thrive. Gotcha. Thank you both so much, and thank you to all of our attendees um, for these questions. It looks like that wraps up. Uh, our questions and the webinar for this afternoon. But if you have any questions that we didn't answer or if you'd like to talk with our expert, experts further, uh, please feel free to reach us through our website. You can tweet us or you can drop us a line at info at focal-point.com. I'd like to thank everyone for attending the webinar today. Um, and as a reminder, we'll be sending everyone a recorded link uh, of the webinar tomorrow. Now, um, as Brett mentioned, in the coming weeks, we will be meeting with Gary McIntyre and Jeremy Archer, who are both managing directors of our cyber defense practice. Uh, so look forward to, to that webinar session coming up. But thank you, everyone, and hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.